our, our, our topic tonight, um, which is the big question, do I keep and feed and, and feed or sell in a falling market? Um, and as I said, that will uh, be um, presented by Phil Graham from Graham Advisory. So just uh, just before we kick off, um, I just got to do a, a quick acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge that we're all dialing in from what was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respect to the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which I stand on today and also extend that to the traditional custodians you are all representing today, as well as elders past, present and emerging. Uh, tonight's event is uh, a part of a series of webinars that we are hosting and have been made uh, possible through a project called the uh, Saving Our Soils During Drought Program, um, brought to you by the local land services and funded by um, the Southern New South Wales Drought Hub, Innovation Hub, and funding from the Future Drought Fund. Uh, the idea of our, our webinars is to assist land, the land livestock producers across the state uh, to make um, decisions in what has been a fairly difficult time for some regions. And uh, there are a number of other webinars coming up um, there is a flyer in the handouts or, and will be attached to recording when it's sent out um, after tomorrow. Um, just a quick plug on those. So feeding sheep in dry times for next Wednesday will be with Jeff Duddy. And then the following Wednesday will be uh, followed up with feeding cattle in dry times with Jeff House. Um, so yeah, there'll be uh, a, a good event to uh, register for as well. If, there, if you have any questions through the, through the tonight, um, you can put them in the um, the, the uh, control panel there in the questions area. Put them in there, and during the webinar, we will um, endeavour to cover those questions and and or at the end of the session. If we happen to run out of time, we will endeavour to have your questions answered after the session by some other means. So we are presenting tonight, Phil Graham from Graham Advisory. Um, one of the most difficult decisions in dry times can be making a call on what stock you sell and what stock you retain and feed. Every drought, dry period is different. So a good strategy in the last drought may not necessarily be a good strategy this time. This needs to be assessed on a case by case basis. Phil will outline the key challenges facing producers at present and factors to consider when developing your specific strategy. Phil has 45 years in frontline advisory work, mainly in the livestock industries, including sheep, beef, goats, and dairy. In the last 33 years, Phil has played a major role in developing and delivering various industry courses and programs, including Progress, Progress Plus, Stock Plan, and Five Easy Steps. Graham Advisory was formed in 2017, specializing in helping producers fine tune their livestock businesses. And no doubt Phil doesn't actually need a lot of uh, introduction to a lot of people on tonight. So welcome, Phil. You are my, on the mute, on the mute, mate. Thank you. Now you can hear me. We can hear you now, Phil. It's all good. Radio, radio, Jeff. We'll get into it. I'll let you go um, for it. Uh, thank you, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to be with you. Mind you, it'd be better if we were together on uh, a different topic. As always, you start off and the there we go. There's four topics I'm going to cover tonight and we'll have some questions in between. Uh, the first one's about seasonal forecasting. Um, the next one's about the quantity of supplement I need. To, if I'm going to feed, you need to be very clear about what's it going to, how much grain or what um, are you going to go through and what's it going to cost. Look at some break evens, which can help with that difficult decision. Am I going to, with, with one class of animals, am I going to jump left or am I going to jump right? And then finish off with some long term impacts of different strategies. So that's looking at what it, it does to your business over a three to four year period. Look, the reason. I'm starting off on seasonal forecasting. I think this is my um, seventh drought dry time I've 
um, worked with producers in my career. And there is no doubt that this one is different in that I have never seen producers A, react so early, and B, um, take all the noise that they're hearing on board to a point that for some producers it started clouding their decisions. I've certainly seen uh, producers make decisions which they really didn't need to make based on their fodder supply. And it's just that it's been, I know it's, you're being hammered with the word El Nino since April, whether that was justified or not. Um, and it's really, really had an impact. And I'm still hearing comments from um, um, media, industry people about this. So I just want to look at the current situation. Now, um, whether, you, whether you like them or not, BOM is, are the people who are in the best position to look at um, long-term impacts of, of uh, climate for Australia. It was very interesting in the in the autumn, everyone around the world was saying, oh, BOM's the you know, first one to say there's going to be El Nino and we should look at that because they're the best ones in the world. And then something else happens, they didn't call it and suddenly they're no longer the best in the world. So I've just gone into their site. Um, you can see down the bottom right hand corner, this was the material that they issued on the 19th of October. I think there'll be another one either coming out at the end of the month or early uh, next month. That is for, that's the forecast for New South Wales for rainfall for the month of December. If you look up above, you see what it is like for November. A lot of brown, a lot of brown across Australia, a bit of white in New South Wales and Queensland, but a lot of brown. We get to December and there is no brown whatsoever. The vast bulk of New South Wales is back to a 50-50 call in terms of what might happen to rainfall. Now, I'd just like to ask all of you, think, is, is that, based on what you've been hearing, is that your view of what the, the current outlook is? Um, I just, we, I don't think, we, we don't do a very good job at actually presenting what they, the information they provide. I actually don't necessarily use the, the median, so that's the chances of above median rainfall, because to make sense of it, you need to know what median rainfall was. This is exactly the same data, exactly the same site, but this time I've just brought up the chance of at least. So I've, over on the left, you'll see 50 millimetres. So this is the chance of 50 millimetres occurring across New South Wales in December 2023. And again, it's on a percentage. So we're seeing some areas, um, up in the uh, northern tablelands and north coast where they're talking about a 75% chance of, of getting 50 mils. I find that easier because it's 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 clear cut. You know, 50 mils or 25 mils or 100 mils, a defined figure you're getting information on, whereas median, unless you know median, it's a bit nebulous. So I always tend to prefer this chance of at least. This is then the text that came under this. So if we look at the heading, drier than median November to January, likely in Western parts of Australia, Southern Australia. That's the heading that has been picked up by media outlets. Let's go down to the second dot point. November to January's rainfall is likely to be below median for most of Australia. Now the key words, except, we see except most of New South Wales. So their forecast for the period of November to January is not, it's going to be drier. In fact, it's something different. Again, have you been hearing that information? And right down the bottom, a very important thing to look at is past accuracy. The November to January long range forecast for the chance of above median rainfall is moderate to high for most of Australia, except for parts of the the bite. So for New South Wales, past accuracy is high. So that's what they're putting out at present. That will again be updated in certainly early November. And if you do go on, please look at the whole box and dice, just don't look at a heading. So that's the map of the November to January period for New South Wales. Um, um, again, up in the top corner, it could be below median, but remember at that time of year, that part of the state, median rainfall is a lot of rain. It only has to be one mil below and it's below median. A little patch out west, 
again, I've, I've pulled up the, the chance of at least, and this time I've asked for 200 mils over the, over the three months. And again, you see a picture of um, what they're saying at present about potential rainfall. Yeah. You can decide what mills you put on there. I've just picked some figures. I think the, the key thing is um, what I'm seeing on their forecasts does not stack up with a lot of things I'm hearing from a whole range of people. And uh, producers, you're always in, a, in circumstances like this, you're in a difficult situation. Um, and you want to make sure you've got clear information about what's being said, not someone's half interpretation of what it might be. I have heard no one talk about that November to January mightn't be quite as bad as things are said, has been said. Jeff, any questions on that? The uh... Uh, yeah, we do have a question here. Sorry, Phil. Um, what was the weather app called that you got that information out of? Right, now, that's that, that's just the bomb. Um, you go onto the bomb site. You go down to agriculture, um, and you you click on the agriculture button, and uh, uh, a drop down menu comes up on the left hand side. You click on rainfall, and you go under that. It'll say three monthly forecasts. So it's on the bomb site, it's under agriculture, it's under rainfall, three monthly forecasts. And then you can just flick through and look at a number of pieces of information. Great. Um, thanks for that. And um, yeah, I think that's it for the moment so we can keep moving. Yeah, look, one thing I should have said, um, it's going to be hotter than average. We are in a, a, a warming world. That's That's, that's the simple fact that we are. So when you're comparing current temperatures over a 30 year average, if you're in a warming period, every year is going to be above average for temperatures. So I don't get hung up so much about the temperature. Um, it's more about what happens with moisture. And let's be honest, in many parts of the state for livestock, a hot dry summer would be very much welcome in trying to knock down the massive worm burns we have in um, certain parts of the state. So there's nothing, there's nothing bad about um, um, some warm, hot periods over summer. Right now, let's move on. Now, in your um, little box that sits on the, the top right-hand side, in there, you'll see the word handout. It's about halfway down, and there's a handout there with, with a two next to it, which said, how much supplement do I need? The PDF, if you hit that, you can download that. Everything I'm going to show in the next four or five screens is in that document uh, with, a, with more explanation. So you can either go and look at this later and write the numbers down, or the easiest way is just to download that, how much supplement do I need? So what I've done here is just, I've done sheep and cattle. So I've got a range of, of um, different sheep sizes, et cetera, and then a range of grains or fodders across the top. The numbers in the box, the 4.2, the 5, the 12.7, is the non number of tonnes of supplement that you'd need to feed a thousand ewes at maintenance for one week. So there's a weekly figure you're going to go through depending on the product you use. Uh, you then multiply by uh, the number of weeks that you think you might be in a feeding pattern. You then multiply by the, the price um, and you're starting to get, as I said, the two key things with the feeding strategy is you're clear about how much grain you're going to go through or how much supplement you're going to go through and what it's going to cost. Some of the worst situations I've seen in drought is um, some of us out there have a mental block in terms of an amount of supplement. You get to X number of tonnes and mentally you say, I can't handle this, I can't, I'm not gonna, I can't feed any more and people bail out. Now, if, if you have a mental block in terms of a certain amount of food, it's far better to find out before you go into the feeding pram that 
program than half a week in it. The worst outcomes I've seen from feeding programs is where the bank comes in and the overdrafts got to a level the bank said, that's it, no more. Work out the amount, work out the cost, show it to your bank. Talking to some regional bank managers over the last two or three weeks, common comment that comes up was, if people don't answer my phone call and don't answer my emails, I get very nervous about whether we'll support them. If I know what they're doing and I understand the plan, 99% we're gonna support. So don't think, oh geez, that's a big number, I'm not gonna tell the bank. They're gonna find out. You're better to have them as a partner up front than as an, an antagonist four, five, six months down the track. The reason I stayed away from putting dollar values on it is that from my experience in every dry time I've gone through, there's been a difference in the order of 50 to $60 a tonne for exactly the same product in exactly the same district. 60 to $70 a tonne. And in some cases, I'm thinking of barley, the barley was pulled out of the same area, was pulled out by the same carters, and people paid a $70 a tonne more than someone else. Uh, I was in Tasmania working with some producers last week, um, these producers were separated by no more than 50 kilometres and discussions we were having there, there was a $100 difference in the value producers thought they would have to pay for grain. Uh, and it was very interesting. It was the quietest bloke in the group who after the discussion had gone on for five minutes, piped up and said, well, I've just gone and bought some barley at $370 a tonne and everyone was saying it's, it's costing $500 a tonne. The price people pay varies. Ask questions, talk to your neighbours. Um, so that's why if I put, I put dollars on there, someone could say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. So well, I've given you the base numbers. So it's a thousand animals, thousand ewes for one week. If the hay is less than nine megajoules, stock will lose weight, doesn't matter how much you put out, they just can't maintain weight. So, and these, and these are worked out such that these animals could be locked up in a containment area. So this is full feeding at maintenance. So that's the, that's um, adult sheep. If I talk on a slide for too long, it freezes. Now this one's a little bit more complicated. So this is in fact referring to the progeny. So this is for 500 lambs. The, the information's up in that top. Um, that's why I think you really need to download that PDF because it's all there. It's easier for you to refer to later. And as I said, this is done for ewe lambs. So ewe lambs growth is always slightly less than male growth rates. So what have I got? I've got three different types of ewes. So 50 kilo merino, 60 kilo merino, and then a, a, a crossbred or composite. So the, depending on the size of the ewe, that's going to have the impact on potential growth rates. And then I've got, um, under that, I've got a 20 kilo lamb, two 20 kilo lambs that were starting off feeding in the merinos and the, and the crossbred lambs, 25 kilos. And then there's two or three rates of weight gain you might want to achieve in those lambs. Now, depending on what you're doing, uh, how you go about it, certainly if, you, if you've got um, crossbred lambs, um, if you're going to feed them, you feed them for maximum weight gain. Just having them bumbled around just is you waste a lot of food. So if, if you're keeping them and you're feeding them, you're going for maximum weight gain. And then if we move over into the middle, I've then got a heavier weight, a 30 kilo, 30 kilo lamb or a 35 kilo lamb. Different growth rates. And again, it's the numbers in the, the dark bold numbers, which again are the tons of supplement required to feed 500 lambs for one week. Now this diet, because we want growth in there, is got some, some grain and 15% hay. So it's, we've got 85% 12 and a half meg grain and 15% of a nine meg hay. They're the sort of numbers you're gonna go through. Now move over to cattle. 
So this is the tonnes of supplement needed to feed 100 cows. And I've done this at two different stages of pregnancy, 120 days and 200 days. And again, it's a ration of, um, of a 4.5 meg grain and a hay of nine. And we have a silage sitting in the middle or we've got straight hay. So as, um, as the size of the cow goes up, obviously the, the, the quantity of supplement we need for maintenance um, goes up. Silage, remember those silage figures are on 40% uh, dry matter. So there's 60% water in those numbers, but that's, that's what you, um, uh, that's where, where a lot of silage is sit. So that's the case. And uh, just a straight hay and nine meg hay. There is some asterisks there um, with the nine meg hay, those cows at 200 days pregnant aren't performing as they, they were at 120 and that's explained in the handout. So the energy content is such with the increasing pregnancy that the performance of the animal starts slipping a bit. So again, they're the quantities you would go through in one week to feed 100 cows. And we just finish off again with the, um, this is 100 heifers for one week with a weight, Amy, for a weight gain of 0.7 kilos a day. Um, three weights of mature cows, again, that's going to influence on growth rate, et cetera. Um, you might think, um, what's going on, what's going on here with the, um, 50k, 500kg cow and 200 kilogram heifer, the, the consumption's higher than the others. To get, to try and get 0.7 of a weight gain on an animal like that coming out of the genetic base of a 500 kilos cow, it, you really struggle to get there. You're starting to push, push genetics. So that's why the numbers are higher. It looks a bit, looks a bit funny, but that's the reality. And over on the, um, the left hand side. Again, the asterisk just indicates that the, those animals aren't performing as they are lower down. So there's the four things, uh, adult sheep, young sheep, adult cattle, young cattle. It's just giving you some supplement amounts, which you can then multiply by the number of weeks or multiply and multiply by the, the price that you're paying. Questions, Jeff? Okay, Phil, yeah, just a couple of questions there. People are having trouble just finding the handouts. So um, in your little control panel where you're putting in your questions, there should be a little menu that says handouts. Um, if you can't find that, um, we will be sending those handouts to you tomorrow with the um, tomorrow with the uh, with the recording. So uh, you won't miss out on finding it. Um, just clear that one up. And what else have we got here? Okay, why is hay not included for feeding a hundred heifers in your data? There, Phil, was a question. Uh, well, uh, I'm, you were going to struggle if I if I kept kept on using the same sort of hay as I've used before of nine meg. Um, I wasn't going to achieve a weight gain in those heifers of 0.7 kilos a day. Um, you could feed hay to those heifers, um, but the weight gain would drop below. So I I set a standard, um, and that's the reason why they would still they would still um, survive, they would put on weight, um, it's just going to be lower. So that's, you know, it's, I've, 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 I've got to pick things somewhere or the tables go forever. So that's just the logic. Um, you could have, you could have fed, you could have fed hay. And if I, I suppose, let's be realistic, if I put hay on there, I was going to have one too many columns. I'll be honest about maybe why it got dropped. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. No worries. Um, probably just another question I'll follow on from that, Phil, just in your experience or your recommendation in feeding cattle, um, there's often a, a bit of a, uh, a bias towards hay from some people. Would you recommend um, people maybe weigh up their options a bit more around, say, pellets and grain with hay rather than being too focused on just a hay supplement? If you're just going to use hay for your cattle, you basically in food, you increase your feeding cost. It's as simple as that. Um, 
uh, prices I've been quoted in the last week. Um, uh, Vetch hay is uh, nearly 500 tonnes, $500 a tonne landed, I guess. And um, I can get barley landed at 420. Barley's got a lot more energy than the Vetch hay. Um, so straight away, your your feeding cost goes up by putting by putting grain in the system. You can you can often drop your your total feeding bill by forty percent, which in these days is pretty pretty critical. Um, can be done. Look, I think uh, we we all do a lot of things because of what we've done before and habit. Um, I know a few people who um, have have swapped over, and they said initially it was very difficult. Um, uh, but once they got used to it and, and got things better down, it's just been a real plus for them. And you know, I, I've got, I, I had 80% grain. If you're going to start for the first time, you might go to 50% grain, 50% hay, then push it up a little bit and just get a feel for it. But the bottom line is your feeding bill will be lower if you include grain or pellets, a higher energy feed in the mix of feeding cattle. Yeah. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, no more questions at this point in time, so we can keep soldiering on. Radio. Now, the um, the topic was about do I um, do I keep feed or sell in a falling market? Um, there was a meat webinar on last weekend. This is mutton prices since two oh six, all the way through. Um, so I can remember most of those sharp drops. So 206 is the one that's maybe been most similar um, to what we've just experienced. And I suppose the thing I just want to look at is that um, prior to the drop in the middle of the year, mutton was about 200 cents. By the end of February in 207, mutton had gone back, had got back to 200 cents. And it sat for three months down at 50, 50 cents. It's October, November, December sat at 50 cents and then bounced, bounced back again. I am not sitting here and going to say, this is what the market's going to do because I just don't know. But if you look at some of those troughs, if you look at the one in 2013, almost in the middle, again, big drop, took a bit longer, but it came back again. Um, with the question, at some point you've got to, Put a mark in the sand and, and say, this is what I think prices are going to do. If you're if you're weighing up on my feeding animals for for a, a market down the track, you've got to make a decision. Um, well, the producer said to me the other day, Phil, your talk's been useless. You haven't given me the crystal ball. Well, no one's going to give you the crystal ball. They're not going to give you the crystal ball on season. They're not going to give you the crystal ball on markets. You've just got to sit around. You've got to talk to people you trust and and make a decision. So all I'm putting there is. That's what's happened to mutton over the last 17 years. Um, that's just expanding the 206 and the 213 um, trough. So there, it shows it a bit easier. Look at the 206 side. It, it was at, it was at uh, July, it was at 200, and it was nearly back to 200 by the end of February. So it was a sharp drop, but it came back quite quickly. In 03, um, we had the drop. It, it, it didn't come back quite as quickly. It wasn't until May that it really jumped off again. Oh, look at these sort of things. Helps me get some handle on what's happened previously. Um, it's there for you to look at. You make up your own mind of um, what that might mean in the current scenario. And there's just the lamb price. Um, the same, same troughs have occurred, whether it's mutton or lamb, they've all occurred at the same time. But again, we see a similar pattern of drop into the trough and it, it, none of it are we sitting at the trough for a long period of time. It's always a sharp V-shape and out, out we come again. Unfortunately, to those cattle producers, I haven't caught those cattle figures, so apologies. Now, I'm moving on to help look at this, this question about do you feed. Now, this is a, these are screenshots out of a program that um, the department developed uh, back in the 1990s called Stock Plan, a powerful program for decision making, and and hopefully we'll see it back in producers' hands um, pretty soon. If 
but what this is, so this is merino weaners. I've done, a, I go across a few different types. Merino weaners, five months feeding, and I've fed them that they were 22 kilos, and I've fed them to get up to 30 kilos. And what you do in the program, you just sort of, you've got to say, well, what value are those lambs on the 1st of November? So I've taken a stab in the dark. You're going to put your own figures on these things. So I've said it on the 1st of November this year, when they weighed 22 kilos, I could only get 20 bucks for them. If I sold them, I'd get some interest. Now, the cost of feeding those animals for five months and getting them moving from 22 to 30 kgs is $35.45. Forty-five ahead. So, how do you get that cost of feeding? We'll go back to those those supplement tables we just talked about for the interest on on the feeding bill, dollar um, twenty. And then, if you've kept them and fed them, the chances are you're going to um, you're going to incur some costs on them. And of that fifteen dollars, five of that is sort of animal health, and ten dollars is a shearing cost because underneath I've said that in that time, by the time we get to the end of that five month feeding period, these might have $40 of wool on them. So you, you add up the first one, two, three, four, five lines down to the cost per head, and you take off the 40 bucks. And what, how you read the thing down the bottom, if you expect replacement wound lambs to cost less than 32 bucks, five months down the track, so we're in autumn next year, autumn 24, if you think you could buy those for less than 32 bucks, we'll sell them now for 20 bucks and don't feed them. If you don't think you could buy them for that, well, what it's saying is, well, I don't like the $35.45 a head, but it might be the lesser of two evils. Change the number at the top, change the wool value, that number at the bottom changes. So what I'm just trying to get here is a, is a concept where you could do that yourself. Now, I think we'd all agree that the interest you could leave out, it doesn't really change things much. So what value are you putting on an animal now? What's the cost of feeding? You can work that out back from the other tables. Uh, am I going to have other costs? And if we're in the wool scenario, am I going to grow wool? Put all that together and it's giving you a picture of where, where you might sit. Now, this is a... a Crossbred weaner, five months, um, and this, these I'm they were 27 kgs at weaning, and I've I've fed them to get them to 47 and off. Um, I've said these animals at the first and over them to 35. So I've just i picked figures which at present I think make some sense. You might say they're not. That's fine. You put your own figures in. Cost of feeding goes up. Why? Because we're driving these animals, we're taking the much heavier weights, we're trying to get them there quickly. Again. Um, the $15 is $5 animal health um, and $10 shearing, but I'm only going to get $10 back for wool. So you might say, well, I'm not going to shear them, so I've got no wool income and the cost per head is 10 so it cancels each other out. And we, again, we look down the bottom. If you'd expect replacement wound lambs to cost, so to some degree, it's this is not, you're not buying them back. This is what you would need to get for them for this to have been a sound strategy. So you're, you've kept them on, you're feeding them to get to 47 kgs. You're going to have to get at least $107 in the market in autumn 24 for that to have, for you to have made money out of. So again, you've got to sit there and make, um, make the decision. And it was very interesting with these group of Tasmanian producers the other day that in the room on a lot of these people split. Some decided looking at the numbers they were going to feed, some decided they weren't. So everyone's going to decide, have their own picture of risk, et cetera. The critical thing when you're making decisions in dry times is that you use numbers that you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable with it, you'll feel ownership of it, you'll implement it and you'll feel better yourself. So that's the that's the lamb one. It's the again, it's the concept of how I've got to these. It's the important thing rather than the figure at the bottom. Um, right, you same thing. Um, the big difference there is now this you. It's dry when I started feeding it in November. I fed it for five months and maintained weight, fifty five kilos empty. Um, but uh, five months down the track, this is in fact a pregnant you. So. If I go to sell now for 25 bucks, 
I need to be confident looking at those numbers that I could buy them back at 46. Um, I think everyone on the on the hookup would say there's no way in the world you're going to buy a pregnant you back in autumn next year, Merino you for 47 bucks. Crossbred you. Um, you can see the numbers. A big difference between the crossbred and the merinos is the impact of wool. Feeding those animals over the five months, wool, you're growing wool, wool markets held up better than the meat market. Um, and that's having a big impact. Uh, crossbred wool is still at pretty low levels. Wean calf. Um, I said it was 200. Oh, no, I said 150. Wean calf for six months, 150k dewy, weaned early, take it through to 270. That was a weight gain of that 0 0.7 kilos a day. Some people might want to feed them at a faster rate, and I fully accept that. The numbers are just going to change. The cost of feeding there's, um, and this is a, a grain hay mix, 317 bucks. Um, so you think you could sell it for 200 now, going through that program, you're going to need to get at least 600 bucks um, at the start of start of winter next year for an animal like that, for that that strategy to make sense. And again, I'm sure if we sat 10 people in the room, some will jump to the left and some will jump to the right. The critical thing is you decide where you want to go. Base your decisions on what you think, not what other people told you you should do. And the last one is the dry cow. I said, well, I could sell it now for 775. There's going to be 406 bucks feeding over that time. Um, a few uh, animal health costs for 15 bucks. Um, if you could get 775 now on the feeding, it's the old story. Do you think you'll be able to buy that cow who will be a pregnant cow um, by the time the end of that feeding period for 1200 bucks? So it's just the logic that sits in this table that I want. Hopefully, that will help people just, just work through their own scenarios. And the key thing, you can decide on price, so you can do that easily enough. And the key thing is the cost of feeding, and you can work that out from those tables we've talked about earlier. Jeffrey, questions? Yeah, Phil, we do have a few questions. Um, just going back to your mutton prices there, were, did those mutton prices account for inflation? Do you know? No, no, that's just purely recording the weekly prices um, the weekly prices from MLA over those years. No, nothing, no, no allowance for inflation at all. No worries. Um, a question around um, why aren't the lamb prices showing the prices of $6 a lamb at, at uh, the Southeast Livestock Exchange a few weeks ago? Um, I can't answer that. Um, if they were, they were, they were, um, um it was an exceedingly lucky sale and i don't know anyone who received prices of anything like that i think that's six dollars a lamb uh yeah six dollars a lamb not six dollars a kilo oh, so oh sorry, sorry 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 yeah yeah well it's um it would depend on uh we'd need to actually look at those lambs to see and the days look there's no doubt about there's no doubt about that there's at present there are some producers having real problems moving young lambs, right? Um, um, it's a bit hard to believe, but Southern, Tas Southern Tasmania is in drought um, and they've got to ship all their sheep out across Bass Strait to get them killed. So producers down there just cannot do it. They can't give them away. Um, so I suppose in coming to that break even, Jeff, is you're putting, you're putting the figures in up the top of what you think um, you can achieve. Uh, some people got six dollars for lamb. I know other people got twenty bucks. Why there was a difference, I can't say. Yeah, look, Phil. I think there's also some old things in there too with the buyers around grass seeds and conditions of the skin and those sorts of things that they discount stock on as well. So there could have been some other things involved with that lower price. There'd be a lot of things like that, Jeff, which don't show up when you just read a, read a market report. Um, Correct. Yeah. Um, 
Next one, Phil, is uh, our producers are able to access the program you've been showing there? Oh, Jeff, look, um, the LLS is in the process of uh, of doing some training for their staff, um, um, which is going to occur in the month of November. So um, I don't want to get LLS staff into trouble, but um, I would think later that the LLS staff will have access to the program. Um, and be able to help you work through some of these some of these issues. Um, some of the things now you can say, for instance, um, all those feeding rates came out of a, a thing called drought pack. Um, with those feeding rates, you really don't need drought pack because all drought packs going to do is give you the same numbers I've already given you in that table. Um, um, yeah, look, it's I know it's it's being worked on. It needs tidying up, but it's a very powerful program. Which, as an industry, we can't um, we can't let it we can't let things slip through the cracks because people forget it was around. It was used extensively during the early two thousands. Um, very high feedback from producers. Um, we just need to get it up and going again. So LLS the, the LLS are, to their credit are training training their staff to put them in a better position to help new producers. Yeah, and, and there are staff who do have access, I believe, already. Um, they're just doing some updating on that one. Yep, yep. Um, and I hope I, have, I hope I haven't caused diplomatic problems with my answer there. Um, just a quick question. Please confirm the feed costs assume 100% feed and no grass in your calculations. Absolutely correct. Now, what I haven't put in, it's in the handout, is that on some of those cases, having some straw in the system would make sense. And I'm sure Jeff Duddy will pick up that very capably next week. Um, so, yes, it's 100% um, grain, no pasture. 100% of the animals' requirements are coming from that fodder in that table. Yep. And um, probably one last comment was um, Jeff Dubbo. There was some lamb sold for three dollars a head last week, so yes, there has been some very light pricing around. But um, that might be our last comment. We can just uh, soldier on a little bit further, Phil. Thanks, Jeff. Radio. Now, this will just take a little bit of explaining. So, what you have on the left-hand side is cumulative cash flow for your business. Now, in doing this work. I've assumed there's no debt in the business as of today. What this is about is that we've got to make decisions. So this is a thousand Merino ewes. Uh, there's been a six month feeding bill incurred. So we've started feeding in late 23, but we've made four different decisions about destocking. So the blue line is for the joining that's going to occur in early 24, we've culled 5% of ewes and we're feeding all the ewes and all the progeny. Uh, uh, 2023's lambs, um, ewes and weaners, uh, weathers, and your replacement ewe hoggets. So while it's a thousand maroon ewes, we are feeding in the order of about, um, about two and a half thousand animals. So that's the blue line. We only sell 5% of culls and those culls, I sold them out now and I got $25 a head for them. Now again, we could talk about the value, but that was where I thought was a fairly robust number to use. The red dotted line is 14% of the use of cull. So instead of joining the thousand in early 24, you're gonna join 860 and all the progeny are still kept. The black line, you've culled 30% of the ewes, so in 2024, you're joining 700, and you've kept all the progeny and fed them. And the black, last black one, which is a black dotted line, but it doesn't show up down the bottom, you've culled the 30% of ewes, and also you got rid of all the weather lambs at, um, $15. This is then what happens in subsequent years. 
what's going to be the financial position in 2025? What's it going to be in 2026? What's it going to be in 2027? Now, I haven't, the, where there's a 30% cull, and certainly the last one, a 30% cull and all the weather lamps gone, your stocking rate on the property has, has decreased quite a bit. So it, I've just allowed it to breed back up. Now, there are things you could do to speed the rate up, which would potentially change the shape of the line. So the, the point I just want to highlight here, given the low values that we're receiving for stock we sell, the strategies of culling less and feeding, while they'll be the worst in the drought year, they end up pulling away quite quickly and, and down the track end up in a, a stronger position. Now, in, in the years 2025, 2026 and 2027, I've assumed that the market has got back to something a bit a bit better. It hasn't got back to the levels it was prior to this. So I, I think I was saying you were selling uh, cull use for uh, $90. We were selling um, uh, 12 month old weather lambs for 80 bucks, those sort of numbers. So the, the, num the, the numbers were certainly better than in 2004. Um, and I can't, and I, this is the problem in doing some of this work. You could get in there and you could put massive increases on prices. But if the prices increase, the blue line is just going to get further away from the rest because you've taken the pain in the drought year um, and you've, you've, you've got production going for the rest. This is all on the basis that it's 100% um, food, so they're locked up. So we're not damaging, we're not damaging our soils. We're not damaging our pastures. If we went back to 2019, when you could sell a cold you and maybe get $140, $150 for it, there was virtually no difference between a 14% cull and a 30% cull. The two lines behaved very similar. So this year has been, I think we're 180 degrees away from where we were in 2019. Um, so in 19, you could happily go and cull a bit heavier without any really long-term impacts. It's not quite the case here um, with these merinos. I just remembered I forgot to put in the crossbred one. But in fact, the message behind the crossbred one was the same. Um, uh, keeping your use, keeping your production up so when prices come back, you've got your, your lambs. There's also overhead costs in this, in this all of this. There's about 20... $20, $20 a DSE overhead cost. So if we haven't got stock on the farm, the overhead costs are still biting your bum. So this year is different in that when we look at it, um, um, hard culling is not tending to show up in the sheep operations as being the best long-term strategy. But there's a number of things that you have to put into in the play with this. I could imagine there's cases who people would take the black dotted line for a variety of reasons. I'm, so I'm not saying in any way one line is better than the other because it all depends how those lines interact with you as a person with you, and you, the finances of your business um, and where your age is and are you physically and mentally up to going through another extended feeding period. I've said this before, I have never seen a producer make good decisions if they're struggling with mental health. Let's not kid ourselves. It's out there in the community. It has been before and it is again now. And you can't hide from it. If, if you're a bit fragile, put your hand up. Previously, I've had some issues. I put my hand up, best thing I did. Put your hand up, get help. If you're having trouble making decisions because of that, get some people who can help you work through these issues. And then the last one, Jeff, is it's it's a cattle one. Now cattle is it's it's a different scenario. So this is for 250 cows, again six month feeding. So the red is a very, very hard cull. So it's 250 cows back to 150 and all the all the early weaning, all the steers are sold and only the replacement heifers are kept. So it's a pretty substantial destocking. That's the red line. 
the black line is um, you go from 250 down to 180, ret retain all progeny and feed. And this is a feeding based on um, uh, about 80% grain, 20% hay. Um, if we were doing all hay on that black line, it, it would fall out the bottom by a long way. So it's just the, um, the, the, the current cost of feeding versus the return in the beef industry, which would, you would say gives quite a different story than what where the beef industry is looking at that. And I must admit, I'd like to uh, acknowledge an old uh, department colleague of mine, Greg Meeker, beef cattle officer at uh, Goulburn. This is, Greg, uh, this is Greg's work and uh, I thank you for letting me use it. So in the cattle scenario, you, you, you've got to think long and hard about how many you're going to feed uh, and how you're going to do it. Jeff, uh, that's it, mate. Very good, Phil. Um, back online. Um, yeah, just that was um, that was good that uh, really showing that difference between um, sheep enterprise and cattle enterprise is quite different at the moment, and mainly around the cost of feeding that's causing that outcome. Um, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yep. Uh, we. Um, we're a bit light on for additional questions now. We've uh, we've answered everything that's come through, so that's very good. Um, we're actually pretty much on time. So um, if you haven't got any last comments here, Phil, that you want to pass on, we um, will soon to wrap up. But uh, have you got anything you want to add in? Oh, look, I'll just 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 try and get um, base your decision on good hard facts and not something that's been passed down by through five hands um whether it's about um whether it's about potential climate it's about markets it's about different feeding things um if in doubt find people who can help you it could be your neighbor it could be someone down the road it could be someone in the lls the critical thing is you get help if you've got difficult problems it's a hell of a lot easier to talk them through with someone who you trust. And the other thing is, don't treat your bank as an enemy in a situation like this, because if you do that, they, you might turn them into an enemy. From my experience over the years, if you're fair with them, in the majority of cases, I know it's not perfect, in the majority of cases, they'll be supportive. And that's it, Jeff, thank you. Yep, there's one last question, Phil, we might just take a minute. With that cattle culling strategy, can you just give us yep. a quick, just a back overview of that and just um, just pad that out a little bit more? If we could. Um, yeah, radio. I was just going to try and go back to it. Can't. Um, radio. So it's, we're, we're, we're sitting in this situation of um, November 2023. Uh, things are looking um, uh, tough. What am I going to do? Um, early weaning makes a hell of a lot of sense. Hell of a lot of sense. So the decision is to early wean. Um, you sit down and you look at the various costings of it, and the decision is depending on um, a range of factors. Um, in, in one in one case, you decide to t take the money you can get for those um, early wean steers and heifers. Uh, the key thing is to keep your replacement heifers because they're the ones that allow you to build back up quickly. If they go, you just stretch out the, the amount of time. Now, the, the one thing in that graph, that that property in 205 and 206 is going to be, it might only be running at 60% um, oh, of its stocking rate. So there, there would be opportunities to try and do a bit of trading to fill in some of that gap. Um, I haven't put those sort of things in um uh but that that sort of thing can be done so the the, the reason of it was that in greg's thinking he says i'll just compare something that's pretty radical which was the red line against something that's more conservative and just let's see that where the pathway goes i hope that makes sense uh yeah phil um yeah i think I think that's hopefully um, helped people out and certainly if anyone has more questions, we can um, definitely be in touch and uh, give you a bit more information about that, those two strategies and um, help you through some of that decision making. Um, just a couple of things. 
in the chat, there's some links that have just been put in there around um, seeking mental health support um, for anyone who might be uh, looking for some of that information. Um, it's uh, it's really important, like Phil said, at this time to um, to look after everyone and um, your staff, your neighbours and your community um, in, t in these tough decision-making times. Um, what else have we got? Um, well, I suppose we can um, thank Phil for tonight's presentation. It was um, a quick wrap of some of the decision-making tools that people can use and um, there's LLS staff and other livestock consultants around that can um, definitely bring those tools to you and um, help you through that decision-making. There's also um, in the chat, there's a survey link um, that people, we would really like for people to fill out if they could and just give us a little bit of feedback on tonight and um, some of the, maybe some topics, answering some questions and providing some topics that you'd like to see us cover in the future. Um, but other than that, it's um, been a great um, information session. We had over 500 um, registrations tonight, which was great. And um, we're really uh, happy with how people are engaging in that webinar series. Um, we do um, have a few last few questions there, but what I might do is we might get answers put onto those um, and send them out with an email tomorrow with the recording, I think, Phil, if you're happy with that. I'm happy with that, Jeff, and thanks for your yeah. um, uh, comparing. No worries at all. And um, anyway, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And at that, we might uh, wrap it all up and uh, let you uh, go, go and do some calculations on your strategies going forward. Thank you. All the best. All the best to everyone. Thanks, Phil.